Hello, and welcome to today's NIASC Virtual Global Forum. Today, we're going to be talking about returning to school during COVID-19 with a focus on the elementary and middle school population. I'm Jeff Bradley, Director of the Commission on International Education at NIASC, and working with me today is Trillium Hiblin, Associate Director of the NIASC Commission on International Education. We're excited that today's audience includes more than 1,000 registered educators and colleagues from the US and more than 65 countries, all part of today's conversation. Thank you for your participation. Educators here in New England and around the world are asking themselves and each other, how are we going to do this? We recognize that this question applies to the practical requirements of managing a safe and effective restart of school operations, but it also applies to the more personal challenge each educator faces when coping with the reality of carrying on amid the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times in which we live. How am I going to do this? We are fortunate today to have assembled educators working in elementary and middle schools who will share some of their thinking and planning with us in hopes of supporting all those listening and grappling in their own contexts with the question, how are we going to do this? Today's NIASC forum, like all our past webinars, will be recorded and made available on the NIASC website, along with any resources provided during today's broadcast. We've created the hashtag NIASC forum and encourage you to use it when posting about today's forum on social media. And for today's webinar, we've turned on the Zoom chat and the Q&A features. Please use chat to send general messages to other attendees, as I already see is happening. You can use the Q&A to submit questions for the panelists. And if you particularly like a question that you see, you can give it a thumbs up to highlight that question. Today, we will also post a brief poll and ask that you submit your replies in just a moment. This will be our first try uh, with the poll system. And thank you very much to everyone who submitted questions with your registration. They're very helpful, as you will see, uh, in planning the script for this webinar. And now since we have only an hour, we won't have time to cover many of the questions that you have, but we will do our best to incorporate some of the most prominent ones. I'll be back at the end to wrap things up, but now I'd like to pass the conversation over to my co-host Trillium, who will start the introductions. Trillium. Thank you, Jeff. As we begin this conversation today, we recognize that the situation around the world is very fluid and that schools are planning for both, sometimes both in-person, online, and hybrid solutions to education for this fall. Many schools find themselves with multiple plans and our panelists today are not unique in that way. They're going to share with us a little bit about their thinking, how to get ready. And as educators, we all like to plan. We like to get things set up so that our students are well prepared. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from educators who range from teaching pre-K to um, grades six through eight. And they work in schools that are private, public, charter, and international schools. I'm now going to ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and explain the context that they work within and their current situation. And we're gonna go in order from the youngest um, students that are served to the oldest. So Abby, would you please start? Sure, hi, my name is Abby Calvert. I teach pre-K at a public school in Waterford, Connecticut. We are a magnet school with over 500 children and our population is all pre-kindergarten or kindergarten. And we have decided as a district to return to school using a hybrid plan. Thank you, Abby. Over to you, Heidi. Hello, my name is Heidi Freeman. I teach grade two at the American School of The Hague here in the Netherlands. We are just outside of The Hague in um, a smaller town called Vassenaar. We have 1,200 students, and our students um, are from over, um, we have uh, over 70 nationalities. Um, and we plan to be face-to-face, in-person school on August 19th. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, and Lori, please. Hi, I'm Lori Ozmai. I'm here in Ankara, Turkey. I teach at Bilkent La Laboratory and International School. We call it 
Bliss. Uh, I teach grade three and I'm also the grade three coordinator this year. Uh, we plan to, I go back tomorrow actually, and teachers will come in, in um, next Monday and then the students will come in on the 24th. So we're getting ready for a face-to-face -face situation as of today. Thank you, Lori. And David, grade five. Uh, Dave Barton, uh, fifth grade classroom teacher at a public school in Falmouth, Maine, um, a school of 900 students, grades K through five. Um, and pending school board approval, our plan is to have students, elementary students in school four days a week for half the day with that fifth day being um, all virtual. Great, and Kristen, please. Hi, I'm Kristen Roberto. I teach in a pre-K through eighth grade um, public Catholic school in Rhode Island. And it's right on the border of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So we have students from both those two states. Our, we have less, a little less than 200 students in a building that has hold, held over 400 before. So we are easily able to go in person and space out starting, we go back August 24th and the students will come in on the 27th. There are families who may opt to stay home, so we're planning for also including the hybrid for the students who do stay home, and then the plan for what if um, we get sent back home. What if, I think that might be a good theme word for us for the day. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Jolene, would you please introduce yourself? You're on mute. Hi everyone, uh, I'm at uh, Next Generation School in Dubai. We're an international American Islamic school from K to eight. We have around 900 students from about 40 different nationalities. We're also planning for a mix. Uh, we have 80% face-to-face and 20% digital, uh, but, but parents have the, the option of choosing 100% digital. I mean, yeah, 100% digital, yeah. Great, thank you. So as we can tell, we have a wide variety of starting plans. And since we have such a diverse group of um, participants on this, uh, this call today, we'd like to run our first of three short polls. You're going to see a question pop up on your screen and please let us know if the school you are working at will be face-to-face, -face, remote, or a hybrid model. We'll just do that for just a moment. It's really interesting to see what others are planning. Great. We're just going to leave that for another five seconds or so. Make sure everyone gets a chance to answer. Great. Okay. So I don't know if you can see the results. Can you see them on your screen? Can someone on my panel give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Can you see those results or do I just need to mention it? Okay. So since this is our first time doing uh, the poll, we have to see how this works. So 30% of our listeners are starting with 100% in-person model. 19% with a 100% remote model, and 50% with a hybrid model. Thank you so much. We're gonna close that poll now. That helps us to think about how to frame our conversation today as well. Um, we've got quite a variety of, of experiences going on here. So we're gonna start with a question um, related to face-to-face, -to -face, since all of our panelists are at least attempting to start face-to-face -face as we start the school year. So one of, our, one of our jobs as teachers is to get our classrooms ready. And this year, things are slightly different. So um, I'd like to ask a few of you to, to ex tell us how your classrooms look different as you're, as you're preparing them. I know Kristen and Heidi, you were both in your classrooms this week getting things ready. Um, Kristen, would you just talk to us a little bit about how your space is different? Sure. I physically moved from downstairs to upstairs over the course of the past weekend to two rooms. So the space, the picture that was up with my introduction was the picture I took yesterday really of the dividing wall uh, where 11 of my students will be in a room on the right and 11 will be in a room on the left. Um, and my husband was helping me and the school has been helping me so much to get the technology so I can project to both screens at one time from a laptop and we were able to get that set up yesterday. So it will be different in that I will be with students in two rooms rather than one. But so overall, our school 
K through five, pre-K through five, I believe even has two rooms for the students. So even if K through five, a K through four are in one room for the beginning of the day, because they can space out with less than 22 in that space, they have the second room for small group work to space out. We are just fortunate enough to have that amount of room um, because otherwise you're so tight in the room that you are in with all your students. So mine are 11 and 11, but with what I call the alleyway along the side for my movement. Um, and um, I'm lucky enough to have a brother of the Sacred Heart will be my assistant movement. So it's the closer side of that room on the right, the far side of the room on the left. That's my husband trying to figure out the technology for me yesterday on the other picture. <laughs> and you can see boxes. I'm not unpacked yet. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you. And Heidi, what did it look like in your grade two classroom yesterday? Sure, so we have, um, we're a preschool through grade 12 school, and we have two campuses. We have an early childhood center that's preschool through grade one, and then um, my campus grade two through grade 12. Both campuses have um, one-way walkways. So we have, you might have noticed in the beginning, there were some pictures of footprints on the floor and um, arrows designating where to be. So that's, um, at our school, we're following the Dutch guidelines. So we need to have only teachers, only adults, social distance from one another, the 1.5 meters. The children do not have to social distance from one another. Um, and then the secondary students, which is middle school and high school for us is grades five through 12. Um, the teachers and students need to distance from, teachers from students whenever possible. When we feel it's not possible to social distance, then they um, encourage us to wear our masks, um, but it's not a requirement. So we're in a slightly different situation maybe than other schools. So in my classroom, I have um, groupings of um, desks of three or four. I have 16 students. Um, and that's uh, pretty common in my grade level, uh, about 16 students. We have four classrooms of each grade um, in grades two through four is our elementary upper elementary. And uh, we also have plexiglass dividers for small group work. So um, I think those uh, we used, we did open in May uh, with the option to open in May, for students who wanted to come back to school and then fully open in June. So we've had the luxury, uh, yep, that's my classroom there. We've had the luxury of, um, in a sense, luxury, I guess we call it, of um, getting some anxieties out and seeing what it's like to be on campus, um, where we did close in mid-March. And then we had had, uh, were on campus for the last, I believe, eight days of school. Um, everyone uh, who is willing to come back, students who are willing to come back could join us. So um, I think that's helped a little bit um, with that too, but we have to, the kids, we have one way stairwells, you know, go up one stairwell and down another, um, that sort of um, dividers. Great, so a lot of um, directional information for kids about how to behave to remind them. Abby, I'm curious from your perspective with the youngest little ones, um, do you still have learning centers and um, carpets and those types of things that usually encourage people, kids to be close to, to one another? Um, so our we, do, we will have learning centers, yes. And what they're gonna look like is um, we're following a cohorting model, both um, with classrooms and then within classrooms is the goal. Um, and we are going to ideally have the same group of kids in the, in the same centers and they're, you know, we'll transition from like, you know, one center to the next. Um, as far as the, our hybrid model, it's looking a little different than um, David's, for example, because we'll have two cohorts, the A cohort and the B cohort. The A cohort will go to school in person on Mondays and Tuesdays. Wednesday is distance learning for everyone, and that's also a deep cleaning day for the school. The cohort will go in person on Thursday and Friday. And I'm not sure, it hasn't been completely decided yet if I will be um, broadcasting like mini Zoom lessons to the students at home during those off days for them. Um, so, and as far as my classroom goes, I'm very lucky. I have a huge room. Um, I know not everyone is as fortunate as so I'm counting my blessings for that. And the plan is we have four foot tables and six foot tables. And like for meal times or any kind of like table center type work, it'll be a child at each end of those tables. And we also have um, sensory tables, which are in my school, I think they're probably about three or four feet long. And those will also be converted into mealtime tables. 
As far as carpets, um, I'm not 100% sure yet, but the only bummer is I have these really <laughs> awesome, beautiful rainbow sheer curtains in my windows that I put up and those have to come down, but you know, it could be worse. So I'm sure it will Thank all you. work itself out. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, Lori, <laughs> Lori, what about in your classroom? So I am very lucky at my school in that I teach with a co-teacher. So he and I are always in the room together. So we can easily divide our class of 20, 10, 10. He would take 10 and teach them in Turkish and I would take 10 and teach them in English. And then we can swap them either halfway through that time or lesson block by lesson block. So we also have a, a lot of outdoor space, corridor, large corridor space, extra rooms that can be used for those groups of 10. So we don't always need to be the 20 students in one classroom. So I feel really uh, lucky to be in that situation where I don't necessarily need to be with all 20 at one time. As far as I know, we're looking into how we can make that work. We're very lucky to be in a co-teaching model and to be able to move forward with that and to have the space for the other 10 to divide out. Great, thank you. Um, Jolene, would, would you mind answering that question as well? Sure, so we will have the mandatory, I think it's two meters distance between the students. Um, in middle school, our issue um, we have all the safety things in place, so that's not going to be the issue. But what we what we we're focusing on is student buy in. So what we've planned, some of the brainstorming we've had is to get students to do a bit of research and ask them, OK, well, what do we need to do to keep ourselves safe? And let students give us that and tell us, OK, well, we need this kind of distancing and we should walk this way. And we, so that the students feel that they've made that up. And even mm -hmm. though we've already got all of that. So for us, our focus, because, you know, some of our boys are a little bit, um, you know, boyish. So we, we wanted to make sure that we have their, their buy-in on what we're doing. But we have the, the KHDA, the UAE government has given very clear uh, structured guidelines for us to follow. I think that that um, document will be available probably in the chat or maybe later for everyone who's interested to see it. It's a, it's a useful document for every country. Um, but for us, uh, yeah, we would also have, um, probably have the students in person in the classroom, but a lot of the work that we're, we're doing will still be digital and the input will still be digital, just that you will be there for immediate feedback. Jolene, just out of curiosity, we just saw the image of what looked like maybe the front of the building with a, um, a little uh, space that, what is that? <laughs> okay, you so, sure, we, we are going yeah. to, this is going to be our sanitation uh, tunnel. Uh, so students will just walk through and be instantly sanitized. Uh, we're also setting up thermal cameras uh, to check the temperatures for students. Uh, I saw something in the chat, somebody made a, a comment about will the girls be girlish. Uh, I, I don't mean to, you know, mix gender stereotypes. Our girls actually are very gentle and very lovely. It's our boys who are um, <laughs> less likely to stay in their seat as mandated. So I didn't mean to offend anyone. <laughs> um, on that note, let's turn it over to David, um, our poor only male educator on this panel. Sorry, David. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I, I hesitate to use the word easy. I think a better word with this social distancing in the classroom, I feel like a better word might be manageable. But our model, um, it doesn't have 20 kids in the classroom at once. So I'm going to have, you know, upwards of 10, maybe nine or 10 at a time. So I think that makes it a little more manageable. Um, but unfortunately, you know, some of those comfy spaces in the classroom that we accumulate, the rocking chairs, the coffee tables, the, the cushions are going to have to kind of go into storage for a little bit right now. Um, but we're incredibly fortunate in our, in our district. Um, they created a committee called ECO, which stands for Educating Children Outdoors. So they've identified 60 places like around our campus that could serve as an outdoor classroom. Um, and many of those even with a canopy complete with like Wi-Fi hotspots and things like that. Um, so obviously weather permitting, I think it'd be a little bit easier for us to social distance outside. Um, but, you know, haven't been able to get into my classroom yet, but certainly things that I'm mindful of are 
trying to optimize the space, optimize the perimeter, uh, minimize those like teacher only areas. Um, but you know, it's, it's the, the reality in the world we're living in now. So um, we're embracing it. And I, for one, am excited to get back in the building. Yeah, thank you. It, it does seem like um, that piece of the planning is very important, how you're going to use the space, how you're going to keep kids safe. Um, another aspect of your planning, uh, what I've heard from you in our chats earlier in the week, um, is around how to think about student well-being during these very challenging times. So could you speak a little bit about what your schools are working on to ensure that when students do get to come back together, that there are ways to process um, what, what they're hearing in the news, what they've experienced personally, and um, some of the lack of social contact they've had with other people their age during these last months. I'm going to kind of reverse the order. And Jolene, I know this is a topic of passion for, your, for you, so would you mind starting on this? Yes, yeah, so um, what, we, what we did in the, when we had the lockdown initially uh, in the Emirates, uh, we focused our inquiry questions uh, based on um, things about the pandemic. And I'll read those questions out because it gave the students an opportunity to look at it from an academic perspective. Um, so we had how might a global pandemic present opportunities and possibilities to create a better society for all. And then we had, in what ways do we need to think differently about health and well-being as we address challenges um, such as the global pandemic? And this gave us an opportunity and the students to do a, a, a number of things. The first thing is all of our middle schoolers completed um, an, a free online course that's run by the Smart University in Dubai. It's called How to Break the Chain of Infection. And this equipped students with student-level information about what it is uh, how, it, how, how infections are passed around, even how to wear a mask properly. So from the very outset, they had this knowledge, they were equipped. Um, the other thing that happened was the, the Dubai government inspected all schools, uh, how we were doing e-learning. And they were not interested too much in how we were assessing and how we were teaching. They, they cared about our focus on well-being. That's how we were assessed. So we spent a lot of time brainstorming how do we make sure our parents, our students, and our teachers are coping? And we did that in many ways. We had a lot of coffee and chats with uh, students one-on-one. -on -one. We had um, like a lot of social activities. Uh, we, oh, our focus was on well-being, and even moving into the first two weeks of school, our focus is going to again be on well-being and how to meditate and how to. We one unit we focused entirely on memes, how to use humor. How do we process a difficult situation? Um, and what do memes tell us about how we deal with that? So, um, yeah, that's, I have a lot more to say, but I'll. I'll <laughs> that could maybe be a great additional entire webinar. And I, I love your ideas, Jolene. Thank you. Um, would any of our other panelists like to speak to that particular question? Just unmute yourself. I know you probably all have things to say. Go ahead, Abby. Yeah, so I, similar to Jolene, when we, return to school, the plan is to focus on regrouping, um, speaking of, you know, to that social emotional piece that's so vital in all grades. But, you know, with your youngest learners, it's a, it's a line to toe between um, scaring them and being honest with them because they're just, they don't understand things in the same way that, that older children or adults do. So we're gonna be focusing on that social emotional piece, regrouping, um, morning meeting um, has been traditionally a time for calendar, for weather, for math stories. And we're shifting that into a time to share, a time to connect, um, to answer questions, to, you know, have a safe social distance greeting. We follow the responsive classroom model. And that's one of the things that the children really like to do as well is like greet each other um, and kind of just shifting it and telling social stories about mask wearing, about germs, about the, the current situation. Can I ask, Abby, what are some of the ways that you've, what are some of the, the, the things that you're telling them to do in terms of greetings that are different? Um, is it well, <laughs> things that they're going to say? Are you doing elbow bumps? What are your... <laughs> What are your options? <laughs> um, you might like mirror someone dancing or you might like 
clap three times or do a wave. I mean, traditionally we, each child or each classroom rather has an apron and there's four choices that are like Velcroed on there. And they, you know, vary from week to week, day to day. And each, we have a greeter and then the child who is being greeted gets to choose. So like obviously the contact ones, like the high fives or the hugs, those are unfortunately out this year. But um, I am confident that my colleagues and I can come up with some very creative ways that are contactless, but also fun and engaging and connecting. Those are some great ideas. I know um, our listeners have always appreciated those direct tips from classroom teachers. Um, yeah. Do any of the rest of you have other ideas about um, building, building your community this fall and um, you know, really enhancing the sense of well-being? Go ahead, David. Um, yeah, so I think a big reason that, that our district had kind of decided, you know, there's, there's obviously more than one hybrid model. And with us going half of each day, four days a week, I think a lot of that was to address that social emotional impact of, you know, as teachers, as students, as families, our worlds were turned upside down in, in early March, right? And so um, at least, I don't know that anything's ideal in our current climate, but um, at least being in the building four days a week, um, is probably, you know, as long as we can be safe with it, uh, a huge, huge plus for our students. I know for me personally, a big thing for me is going to be just following a routine um, early on. And that doesn't need to be like an academic routine, right? So, um, you know, early on in the day, just kind of finding out where, what kind of headspace are kids coming into school with and, and all that stuff can wait. Yeah, yeah our t we're in a time crunch, two and a half, three hours a day with the kids, but you know, what, what I've learned through this experience is that all of that stuff is so secondary to the headspace and, you know, the, the mindset that kids are coming into school with. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine how excited kids are going to be um, to be back in the building. It'll be different. But as I've always said to, to last year's class, different doesn't need to necessarily mean worse. So I think a big thing for me is just going to be a routine. And, and to Jolene's point, um, getting student buy-in, right? So what is that routine going to look like for us? A community meeting, a, a socially distanced community meeting, things like that, I think are, are going to be so much more important early on than any sort of just, you know, blitzing them with material and content and things like that. Yeah, great. Um, I'm just going to switch gears, Lori, but I'll let you go first and you can integrate your other um, answer there too. But when we think about um, the students who are unable to come to school for various reasons, um, their, their family situation or um, a health consideration and, and or students who are living in more difficult family or economic situations um, or challenging stories, um, how are you thinking that this year, how are you gonna support these students from the start of this year in a different way than you may have had to in the past? Lori, do, do you want to take that one or do you want me to come back to you? I think, I mean, I don't necessarily have students because we're all coming back. It's, you know, either on, okay. either we're all online or we're all in the classroom. But I think the answer to any of these is coming down to communication and to being open to students coming to you to talk to you, to you opening those lines of communication not only with the child and themselves, but with their parents, with your colleagues, that this has to be the year where we're actually talking to each other a lot more about the deep stuff, not the surface things, but like, how is this working? Why isn't it working? What answers can we look for? We can't always just go to like, oh, COVID, you know, we'll move on, but we need to think like, what is it about this situation that we're in right now? That is, we need to actually like reflect and properly reflect on what, what works, what doesn't work, how we can move forward and to let the students know that they need to be part of that reflection process as well. Yeah, great point. Um, Kristen, would you like to speak to that about dealing with students who maybe are unable or unwilling to come to school or have other complicating factors? Sure. Yeah, I've been really thankful at my school for the past a little over a week has run parent afternoon and evening Zoom sessions that parents could choose to come to to ask questions, like question and answer. And by attending those, I really learned not only what parent concerns are, how many parents are considering that, um, sending their child to school, 
in the fall. Some students were even in the background, so I could see like which questions did students kind of come back into the screen for? What are they most interested in hearing the answer to from um, the school as well? And also it just gave me a sense as people, like, within that conversation, they were talking about their summers a little bit. Um, so I learned, okay, who has had some experience wearing a mask, who has not had to wear a mask for the summer um, with their own family. So how difficult will that be as we come back? So I was thankful that my, if you have an opportunity to have some question and answer with your parents before you go back, I found that very helpful. And then also just the, the I am gonna use outside as much as possible. We are also lucky enough to have outside space and families who've offered us tents for those spaces or canopies. The, the use of outside space, I need to make sure those students who choose not to come to school that I can still have them over Zoom while we're outside. So that's had me, that, that question from a parent on a panel had me looking all right, which am I taking a laptop outside? Am I using the iPad for that? Um, so just lots of things to consider because yes, I think we'll have to get a good gauge each day of how the students are feeling and how nervous they really are. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings some equity questions into play as well. You know, if you've got, if you're doing Zoom at the same time you're working with students in a room, is that the same, um, you know, type of experience, especially like you mentioned, Kristen, if they can't hear you well, for example, if you're outside, um, you know, is that going to cause problems? What are some other um, ways that you've been thinking about helping the, the most vulnerable students in your population? Heidi? Um, I was thinking that it's really important to, um, I'm similar to Lori's school where we're all going to be on campus. That's, uh, currently that's our um, scenario right now. Uh, it's really important in that responsive classroom morning meeting time to even more than we normally would, like the first six weeks of school or that beginning where you're establishing all those routines to really listen to them and see what they, you know, what are they thinking and talking about and kind of gauge what they want to share. And, um, you know, it's kind of surprising sometimes how much, you know, we, we want to get onto the next thing and forget to listen. So really listen into mm -hmm. what they have to say. And I was also thinking um, when Lori was talking about using um, your counselors too. So really lean on those counselors for any um, ideas or help that they can provide. Use your resources within the school or your, um, you know, learning support teachers or whatnot. But the counselors have a lot of um, great ideas um, and bringing them into those morning class meetings um, as well, I think would be really really helpful. Yeah, great ideas. Do you, um, do any of you have any other particular tips about um, ways that you're orienting students to what's coming, orienting new staff? Um, Kristen mentioned the parent orientation or, or Q&A. Are there any ways that you're doing that differently this year? David? Yeah, so our, um, <clears throat> our district is working right now. Obviously, things are still being finalized, but um, one thing that I really like, I thought was a really cool idea, we have at our high school, which is, we have one campus, um, and we have a, a very strong kind of AV department. Um, so there are some high school film students that in the coming days are gonna be working on creating a video that's gonna be sent home to families, um, just to give them, because while we can't be in the building right now, we can essentially bring the building to them. Um, so having a little bit of fun with a, a kind of a virtual orientation of, you know, like I said before, it's gonna be different, but um, you know, we can embrace it and different can mean great. So. Um, you know, here's where we need our masks on. Here's what the playground is going to look like from now on. Here's our hallways are going to look a little different, things like that. So at least, you know, kids sometimes have enough anxiety in a normal school year coming in for those first few days of school with, with a lot on their mind. So I think maybe a video or some sort of visual will hopefully put them at ease and, you know, they can kind of visualize in their head what those first couple of days are going to look like because as teachers, we're stressed. I know administrators are stressed. I can't even imagine how students are feeling. Um, so I, I liked the idea of this video kind of giving students a little bit of a visual of, of what the start of the school year is gonna look like. Great tip, thanks David. Um, Jolene, you had, a, had something to mention too. Yeah, so our school actually made a video um, showing students where they'd be walking and different ways to greet each other, um, you know, air high fives, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, I just wanted to go back to how we're dealing with students who, wouldn't gonna, who aren't going to be on campus. We've got a few things. We've got a, a, like a parent uh, or a family liaison officer who will be calling those um, parents on a daily basis if students are out. 
Uh, we also have like the, our school has decided to really go for the personal touch. So even our superintendent, um, he will call families personally on a daily basis to find out how they're doing. Uh, and you know, your, your teachers, your, so we're, we're really trying to open up that conversation. We also have a plan to teach our students how to treat each other. So if somebody does get sick and they go out, how do you how do you treat them when they come back? You know that person's not going to have cooties and doesn't have to be avoided and isn't mm -hmm. weird. Uh, so that's one of the other things that we're we're also focusing on. Um, for the entry and entry into uh, in school, we're staggering. So we're having certain grades come in at, at twenty minute intervals, um, so that there's no crowding in the buildings, uh, there's no queuing in the sanitation tunnels, and we're also ending the day at different um, times for, for, for grade levels to leave at different times. That's great. And actually, what you just mentioned is a perfect segue to a question that we're getting a lot, which is, um, what will happen in your school that you know of? What are the plans when either a teacher, a staff member, or a student either tests positive or shows symptoms? Um, what, what is that plan? And also, related to that, are, the, are your teachers and or students being tested prior to starting school? That seems to be a frequent question in our chat today. Um, Abby, it looks like you went off mute, go ahead. Yeah, so um, can I mention one thing that I'm gonna be doing before I answer that question? Yes, please. <laughs> so um, we are actually doing a, a, you know, a virtual meet the teacher day and my plan is to use my assistant um, who is wonderful and have her be like the student and kind of take her through the classroom as, as I would a student so that the students kind of get a feel for not just the tour, but here's a person, you know. Um, so I'm kind of excited to do that. We'll have fun with it. Also, no, no one is required to be tested before the beginning of school, students or staff. Um, the plan for if you're just symptomatic, um, you are to leave immediately. Um, as a staff member, you know, notify administration and leave. Um, and you will be allowed back when you either have a negative COVID test or you have a doctor's note saying that it's not COVID, it's XYZ. Um, if you do test positive, there you're not allowed back until you are fever free, well, for 10 days. And then I think it's also fever free for 48 hours or 24 hours rather. And the same goes with students. Okay, nurse isolation room this year as opposed to just the nurse's office so thank you um does anyone have a different experience heidi so we um uh i have shared a link um through it's our uh, public ash page and it shows our roadmap of our three scenarios but it also has a link if you click on it it will say um what the protocols are so um if you are symptomatic then you do have to um, leave immediately that sort of thing but following the dutch guidelines that we have here um the if someone becomes sick, um, they will inform us what to do. So we kind of, maybe it's a different situation than in the States or other countries. So we, we are told what to do, um, what protocols to follow based on that. Um, and then I wanted to just piggyback a little bit on Abby's. We're also doing virtual meets prior to school. We usually do a big ice cream social meet and greet day on Tuesday, the day before school. And we have hundreds of people in this very, not a good size space usually, but now to, to to think of that is impossible. So um, we're doing the same virtual meets and um, I like her classroom teaching assistant idea um, as a student as well. But uh, mm -hmm. so just to get parents, because we're so used to, especially in elementary, of talking to parents sometimes daily at drop off and pick up. Um, and parents are not, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, not allowed on the campus unless by um, in, um, administration invitation. So um, we will have all of our parent communication, you know, through email and Google Meet instead of Zoom. That's what our platform is. Um, so it's an opportunity for them to see our classroom virtually the day before when they normally come in and, you know, um, say hello to us and meet us and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Do any of your schools have a policy in place where if there were a negative, or I'm sorry, a positively tested person in your community, that school would go 100% virtual um, upon that news? No. no, not a hundred. 
virtual, but we're following okay. a, a contact tracing. So if a teacher or a student in the class, then we're, we're contact tracing and everybody's going to be out for two weeks and until they all get tested. Um, and we're working digitally if they're well enough. Great. So it, it, Kristen, go ahead. I just, this is the biggest question I really have for, I know our nurses have spent hours and hours on um, calls with the state and there is an act, there's a playbook, which I know Massachusetts has one and then ours will, it will apply for Rhode Island. Um, the playbook of if this, then this, if this, then this with so many scenarios um, that I'm still looking to understand. So I'm thankful that our nurses have spent so many hours and they're, they're then gonna educate us because a lot of parents asked on that Zoom evening, well, what if, so my other child who goes to a different school, what if someone in their classroom tests positive then what do I do with my child? Um, so yeah, I've been thinking the same thing without my own, within my own house. I have two going off to college, but what if they get sent home? My husband's yeah. a college professor, but they're luckily testing every seven days. So I will know for him, but, but we are not testing. Um, so that's a big question I think parents have. And for us just to keep up, I think it'll probably change every few weeks in each state. So I think we just have to keep up with it. Yeah, definitely. So complex. Um, so it seems that we all have to be prepared to flip to more more remote learning at any time. So you must have all your plans in place or at least working on them to um, continue or improve upon the distance learning that you did in the spring. So at this point, I'm going to ask my colleague in the background to put up a second poll because we're curious about from our listeners perspective, what are the main platforms that you use for your online um, experience. Lots of choices there. So we'll give that about 20 seconds for people to answer. And then in the meantime, um, I'd like to ask the panelists to think about um, the, the platforms that you're using and how you may be adapting your curriculum to the scenario that, um, that you have in front of you. And as David mentioned, you know, maybe not all of the the topics that we've covered in the past may not be as relevant as some of the social emotional pieces and um, support pieces. So um, while we finish that poll, just give that another five seconds here. Um, and there we go. Okay, you should see the poll results. So it looks like Google Classroom is the most popular platform that we're seeing with um, Zoom at 69% as well as Google Classroom. Microsoft Teams at 17%, Seesaw 35%. I know I hear a lot of a lot of elementary classes using Seesaw, and um, some other pretty popular ones, Flipgrid, Kahoot, and other. So very interesting. Thank you for participating in that poll. Um, let's see who hasn't spoken lately. <laughs> Lori, um, what are you using in your in your grade three um, experience uh online? So when we went out in March, we were out from March to June, and we were using Google Meets, and we were using Seesaw primarily as our two platforms. And I think what led to our success was that we had been very well established in those two platforms. We'd been using them for, for years. Everybody was able to do it, including the students. So we also, and we also have a very strong IT department that helped us moving forward into the what if, because we are going face to face, so it is a, a what if uh, situation. We are moving to Zoom for our classrooms because we wanted the, some of the other options that they offer. And we're also going to Toddle because we had been talking about moving to Toddle and out of Seesaw before all of this happened. So this was just natural part of the course for us. I mean, the thing that's really, lucky for us is that we have a really great strong IT uh, mindset at our school where we all know it's part of our teaching it's part of you know what it looks like right now in the classroom and so most of our teachers are really keen to like try these things open-minded and the thing that's great I think about like going between classroom like Google Meets and Zoom is that they're they're transferable skills they're they're very easy enough to make that switch doesn't doesn't scare me or and it shouldn't scare anybody because they're basically the same thing just a little bit different you know like it's just a little bit different and so i feel like this is a time to be super open-minded about it and you know how we're using these tools online and the students will learn it faster than us anyways so 
I think we're all going to be set. That's how we're moving yeah. forward. For what Thank if? You. Thank you. Um, Jolene, I think your school has it set up from the get-go, right? I mean, you, you're set up for both online and face-to-face, -face, um, from what I heard you say. In our elementary, and we have, sorry, go on. Go on, go ahead, please. <laughs> our elementary, we're using Seesaw, and uh, I think uh, we might be moving from Zoom. Uh, we were using Edmodo for our middle school and Zoom, but uh, our management has decided to move the middle school onto um, Microsoft Teams. Um, and uh, our PE and art will be online um, and there'll be like our other subject is moral education. It's a, it's a mandatory subject in the UAE. We'll be set, the tasks will be set online with asynchronous tasks that students can complete at any time. Uh, I think most of the schools here follow an inquiry based uh, model. So for us, this really suits the, the kind of the digital e-learning um, way that we're moving because we present students with these questions and you can do these guided discoveries, digital guided discoveries with them. We, we're not really lecturing to them. There's no need for us really to be uh, in, the, in the traditional classroom setup. So we're not terribly worried about that. Um, yeah. Do any of you worry about what students will have learned last spring or not have learned last spring and um, what you're going to be getting in your classes this fall in terms of maybe some gaps in learning um, key skills and things like that. I'm particularly interested, I think, in the, the earlier grades, um, you know, related to literacy and so forth. Um, Heidi, do you mind speaking to that? Sure. So um, one thing that our um, administrators, our principal and assistant principal and counselors uh, chose to do was to loop cohorts to the next grade level. So not the teachers. So if you're a kindergarten teacher, you're still in kindergarten, but your whole kindergarten class moves to the um, first grade as a, as a group because they missed so much time together in the spring and we were wondering about gaps. So now as a second grade teacher, I only have one teacher I need to communicate with instead of four about what, um, about the individual students, but as, as well as what was, um, what curriculum did they, were they able to maintain and um, keep up with during the VLE. So I think it's also goes back to the student well-being. I think those kids are going to be feeling so comfortable, especially second graders for us move from a different building to a new building but and then also in these times so they will all all already have each other and then we have new students coming into those classes of course um, that will be integrated in but I think that is helping us the most with understanding what the gaps might be and um, and um, just having those same groups together I think is really key I don't know if that's possible this late in the game for some people are we decided that back in May so that um, helped a lot during the situation. And if we happen to go on VLE again, the virtual learning environment again, then we, um, those kids still have each other as a group. And not only the kids, but the parents, because the parents get very comfortable with one another as a group, even though they, you know, they may know people in different classrooms, they have each other, they have their WhatsApp groups, that sort of thing, to lean on each other and um, to support one another. So um, if it's possible for your school to do something similar, <laughs> and of course, looping with the teacher is ideal, but, um, in bigger schools, I know, you know, it's a little more challenging yeah. as well. That's a great strategy. Uh, David, what's the situation in your school in terms of um, assessing where kids are when they get to you? Are you getting a, a whole new group of students? Uh, yeah. So, you know, we have either seven or eight um, classes from the previous grade. So we've had vertical meetings both with, for myself, with fourth grade and sixth grade, just to kind of address some of those gaps. Um, but as I've said, and we'll probably continue to say, I just think that those gaps, they'll be addressed in due time. I just think that's so secondary to, especially early on, just making kids feel comfortable, giving them hope and, and bringing normalcy to just this unprecedented time. Um, but as far as class construction, um, I know there's been some thought put into, um, you know, co uh, pods or cohorts of, of kids from, so I'm not getting kids from eight fourth grade classes. I might be getting kids from four. Um, and it's not a perfect situation, but there's, there's some comfort level with, you know, some, some kids that they've been in classes with. Um, but as far as gaps and things of that nature, you know, we talked to the, the grade below us and the grade above us. And just the reality was we're not able to address everything. You know, um, it, it was a crazy time and we had this kind of emergency remote learning dropped on us. And it was, uh, you know, 
permission to give give ourselves grace and and just kind of have that discussion about what we weren't able to cover maybe what we weren't able to to dig as deep as we would have liked to um so i think you know teachers will, will inevitably feel that out but like i said that that will come in due time i mean my focus is early on is just going to be bringing that community back and just you know getting kids back to feeling like you know they did about school before all of this happened yeah great you know we've had a lot of questions in the the registrants that the registrants sent in around pedagogy and how that may be adapted for very specific situations so for example um abby we had a lot of questions about how you would or did last spring adapt um, to some sort of a digital experience for the youngest students. So could we start with that? And then I'll ask um, a few other specific questions about particular types of pedagogy as well. Okay, yeah, so um, one of the concerns, of course, when you're moving from an in-person to a digital format is equity. And um, we worked really hard to make experiences equitable for students home environments and in my school um, just over 50 percent of our students receive free or reduced lunch so that gives you an idea of the um, ses of our environment our, our school and for example thinking about um, if you have a particular center and we did do we did do centers virtually as well like give parents ideas but if you have a material like unifix cubes well kids don't have those at home most of the time. What can you use that's common in the home environment, even if they go out and collect small stones or um, pieces of dried pasta or cereal, that's gonna serve the same purpose as the material in school. And I think another um, huge part of that is um, taking pictures of the centers to show to parents. Don't just describe it in words. We have a lot of families um, whose first language is not English and they don't, they're not fluent in English, either speaking or writing. So, you know, the whole saying of picture is worth a thousand words. Well, there you go. Um, so that's my line of thinking. And I think that will continue in the fall. The goal is to make the home learning experience, whether kids opt in for distance learning a hundred percent or what on their off days when they're home and not in school, depending on the cohort, is to also think about equity and how we can bring equitable experiences into the home that are gonna hopefully serve at least a very similar purpose to what we are doing in person in the school classroom. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is about um, language learning and how we can best do that both with face masks on as teachers and with students in some cases with face masks on when we can't see the person speaking and also in the virtual sense. Um, we had some questions come in about how to best teach languages um, virtually. Let's see, who would like to answer this one first? Maybe, maybe Jolene? Okay, well, uh, I wanted to mention an online, a free online course that I did. So if there are any English teachers out there, it's called um, How to Teach English Online. It's a Cambridge University course run by FutureLearn. And it will give you so many resources and ideas for teaching English, uh, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So I can also uh, link that to Niask and they can share that with you. That's really going to be something that's going to help and change the way that I teach. Uh, more than that, though, we will be wearing face shields and when necessary, remove the mask. Uh, but I think that's different with the younger learners. With us, it should be okay that we, we, we have the mask on for most of the day. Uh, but we will have face shields and remove the mask with a two meter distance, say what we need to say and then return the mask. Digitally though, the benefit is if you film yourself um, doing phonics or speaking, you can get really close to the camera and your mouth can get up close there and students can see that. So there's nothing, no barrier really for, for teaching language. So that could also be used with your students who are face-to-face. -face. Is that what you're suggesting? Pre-recording some phonics related videos, short videos that can be deployed in the actual classroom. That's, that's a fantastic idea. Any other thoughts about this, Lori? You look I mean, like I, you were ready to say I something. I think Colleen's <laughs> ideas are amazing. I don't, I don't even know what I could add. I, I agree that I, I would be using the face shield 
separate out. I also am thinking that maybe if I'm, if, for, if all the students are facing forward and I'm at the back of my desk, I could cam myself onto the projected screen so that there's like a giant Miss Laurie at the front of the class and they're, you know, able to actually see my mouth and my face. And I mean, as scary as that might be, it might also work for classroom management. I don't know. But like, they would then be able to see the, you know, my face a bit more. I think the, the idea that, you know, for myself, it mostly I'm thinking of other people is to slow down, enunciate, they it just, you know, give your students grace, give yourself grace, be patient. They will, they will get it. The face mask, I think, is also going to be our, like the shields are going to be our friends for this part of teaching. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chris, I'm going to go to you, but before we do, I'm just going to mention to our listeners that we are going to go about 10 minutes over and you're welcome to stay. The whole recording will be available on the website if you aren't able to stay for the last 10 minutes. And I thank our panelists for staying on for a few extra moments. So go ahead, Kristen. I also am loving what Jolene is sharing and I'm thinking about the app Show Me that I used a lot once we got sent home. Before I saw them over Zoom, I would send the math lesson or the grammar lesson in the form of a short show me that they again could, I would put the link on Google Classroom and they can listen to it. The parents told me that helped because they were at least hearing my voice before they were able to see me for the day. But they also then, they're fifth graders, they were responsible for knowing the math lesson and my explanation on the whiteboard on Show Me before we got to class on Zoom. And the number of times I've been somewhere when I have the mask on, people have asked me to repeat something. I've been worried about that. So I think I, now that I can project to two screens, even though I'll have them with me, I think I'm still going to build show me's. And so that if they can't hear me from that door in the middle of the two rooms with my mask on, they're gonna hear the lesson as I project it, but then I'm right there for the follow-up and the small groups. So I kind of get the best of both worlds, I'm hoping. And then if we get sent home again, then they are again familiar with what I'm using. Um, so great, great ways to, to maximize the opportunities that you have with your students. I can see from our chat that people are enjoying all of these tips. Um, I, there's so many other questions I want to ask you all, but I would like to um, turn our conversation just a little bit to how you are doing um, as people um, who may have your own families and own um, situations to deal with. Um, how are you balancing that personal and professional aspect of this um, un unique time? And right as we do that, I'm going to ask Selena to put up um, one more poll because we'd like to get a feel from our audience about how they're feeling about going back to school. Are you excited? Do you have concerns? Um, so let's see how that poll turns out. And then um, I'll ask you each to answer that question about how you're doing, how you're doing planning to manage um, this year. There are a few extra words in this poll, so I'll give it a few extra seconds for reading time. About five more seconds. Our panelists are answering as well, I believe. Great. Okay, so 29% of you are excited to get back into your classroom. 48% have concerns about in-person teaching but think the benefits are worth the risks. 14% are unable to go back to their classroom but wish they could. And 9% are unwilling to go back to the classroom but don't, um, don't think that, they're worth, that the risks are worth it. Very helpful for us to see that, thank you so much. Um, and we can share these poll results along with the video um, on our NEASC website afterwards if you're interested in thinking about that again. So why don't we go in reverse order of how we started the introductions and start with Jolene and we'll go backward um, from the oldest students that you serve down to Abby, um, the youngest. And let's talk a little bit about your um, personal state and how you're going to balance those um, professional and personal responsibilities this year. All right, well, I have to say uh, most of us in Dubai are feeling, or in the UAE, are feeling quite relaxed. We have very good leadership and clear guidelines. So we're not really, uh, for the most part, as a teacher, I'm not really stressed out. 
Um, as a parent, I have a young daughter. I'll be honest, I wouldn't send her to nursery at the moment. Uh, my husband will take care of her for the first couple of months until we see what happens. Um, but I have been spending a lot of time upskilling myself. I've done a lot of um, courses and online training and things to make myself a better digital citizenship or citizen, a better, a better di digital teacher. Um, but I, honestly, I feel fine. I feel great. I'm relaxed. I trust my government. I trust my leadership at my school. So for me, I'm cool. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, Jolene. Uh, David, let's go to you next, please. Yeah, so I mean, I think a big takeaway for me early on in the spring was, um, and I, I learned it the hard way, was to have an end to your day, right? So, you know, we're, we're at everyone's beckoning call through email. And, and early on, I felt compelled to respond to every email, like as they came in, and it, you just can't, it's going to drive you up the wall. Um, so that was something that I, I picked the time in the afternoon. Uh, and that was my end time. And, you know, I might make a to-do list of things that I need to get to for the next day. But uh, as someone, we had our first child, a daughter, um, six months ago. So right before the shutdown. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, I talked to my fifth graders last year about silver linings. And, you know, you may not see it now, um, but, but pick something. There's something good that's going to come out of this. And for me, it was time at home with my daughter that I, I never would have gotten. Um, but the balance thing is huge. Um, and conveniently enough, um, with my students, I do a thing at the beginning of every school year. It comes from an author named John Gordon. Um, and he has this idea of a one word. So it's kind of like a, a New Year's resolution. But as we all know, you know, January 5th, you know, you, you fail in your New Year's resolution and then you wait till the next year. So the one word is just that kind of North Star, that guiding light that whenever you need it. Um, so I've used them in the past, love, purpose, things like that. And conveniently enough, mine for this year is balance. Um, and so I've, I've tried to figure out um, some new hobbies and things like that. But, um, you know, and I think it's super important for us as teachers to, to communicate that to our students. So, you know, last year in the spring, it was talking to our kids about, you know, yeah, here, here's your work for, for the day, but it's 75 degrees and sunny out and it's been raining the last three days. So go find a comfy spot outside and read. This stuff can wait, um, you know, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so the balance is huge. Um, and to Jolene's point, I, I, feel, I feel very strongly with, with our administration and, and the protocols that are being put into place. Um, and as long as we can safely do so, I'm, I'm excited. It, it's what we live for as teachers, right? Um, I'm excited to get back in the building. Thank you, David. Kristen? I was also part of the 29% who's very excited to go back. And I, I think part of my comfort comes from, yeah, the support that I have around me. My school has, was amazing at the transition in the spring and we're ready for, we get to go back, but we're ready for both scenarios now. Also that I, it's a Catholic school, I'm very Catholic. So I pray every day, I never feel alone. I, I actually feel really ready to, to do this. And I know the students um, are right, I think, able to find comfort in that as well and that we're such a nice community. Um, as a parent, I do have two students going to college. That's where my fears are at the moment. Um, so they've called me out and, and I keep saying I'm not stressed. I'm so ready to go. But my two adolescent daughters have said, then why do you have stress acne all over your face, mom? <laughs> so i <laughs> called out on the fact that you say that you're relaxed, but you're letting off the cues that you're not. That, so yeah, we're all worried. And then I have a son going into seventh grade who will, because both colleges are open very soon, be the only one at home. Um, so I'll just get him to school each day and then go to school. Um, we are lucky enough to all be going, so. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Lori, over to you. I am very ready to go back, like physically, emotionally. I want to be in a school routine. I thrive well with routines, um, but I'm not going to say that I am not uh, struggling with anxiety about it at the same time. There is definitely moments where I feel my, my anxiety is full on and it's not anything that I, that it can be controlled. And I know that about myself. I meditate and get myself through it. Part of it is becoming, because I'm coming as a teacher coming back and I, you know, care for my students and I care for my colleagues and I want everyone to be healthy. I'm also coming back as a parent. So my two daughters are going to school and like, it's just, it's a, it is a lot. And I'm, I'm not going to say that everything is perfect and we're all going back and all the answers are there. That's not what it is. And, you know, I'm, I want to go back. I'm ready to go back. 
but I'm shaking while I do it. <laughs> like I can say that. Thank you for being honest. It, we, it's great for all of us to hear that. Um, let's see, it looks like we're over to Heidi next, please. Um, I am also part of that 29% who's excited to go back. I think um, I have, you know, concerns as our numbers start to rise here in the Netherlands. You know, we always are on the lookout for what might happen, but I feel that our school, based on how we transitioned in the spring and what we know now from that experience, that we could transition again to virtual learning if we needed to quite easily. Um, I think um, it's been a different summer as we're international. We did not travel back to the States this summer. Um, and that was hard for our family. We have family in New Hampshire and in Vermont that we didn't get to see and friends. Um, so we're doing as much virtual as we can and um, staying connected and whatnot. Um, but that is un unusual for us. And uh, an interesting thing about teaching internationally is travel. So that's much less now. So that's kind of a, you know, you have those emotional things to go with mm -hmm. th that as well. Um, but it's important to take care of yourself and take time for yourself and to build in that family time. We have two daughters um, going into sixth grade and eighth grade. So luckily they love school and um, they, I can't wait to go back. One wanted to go back about a month ago. So, <laughs> so it's not hard to convince them to go back because they're ready as well. And uh, so I think it's, uh, it is challenging, but remember to take care of yourself as well. Thank you, Heidi. Abby? Yeah, I was part of the 29% too, but if I'm going to be completely transparent, I, I'm anxious as well. Um, I am an asthmatic, and in that vein, my own two children who are going to be in second and fifth grades will be home with my husband. He's a college professor. We're fortunate that he can do the semester um, distance learning for his own purposes. Um, but I'm really ready to get back in my classroom. I, you know, when we were hit with distance learning, it was this all of a sudden and whoa, like all this, well, it was new to me, technology, a lot of it. Um, so I've taken the summer to just really familiarize myself, play around in some different ways of doing things, really kind of reflect and think deeply about, okay, this is a likelihood of this happening again, you know, going full virtual. How, how can I better myself in order to be a better teacher for my students? And when you have pre-K students, you're relying a lot on the families and how can I help my families, um, you know, familiarize and get comfortable with this technology. So that's kind of been my summer, um, which is fine. I have really enjoyed kind of the learning piece of it. And as far as um, my, the physical environment of the school goes, I mean, you might think that like, over 500, three, four, and five-year-olds is going to be complete chaos, and it's not. Um, if there's one thing my colleagues and my administration know, it is young children, and I have full faith that we are going to make this work. We've got this. I, there's, there's not a doubt in my mind. I have faith in my district. I have faith in my administration, and I have faith in my fellow colleagues. So, I mean, like, let's do this and make the best of it, because it doesn't have to be perfect to be okay. Wow, you guys, I have to say, I'm, I'm actually kind of choked up. I hope I don't lose it here. I'm going to pass it off to Jeff in just a minute. But I just want to say that these forums have been such a rich um, way for our extended learning community to share a common shared experience during this very difficult time and your willingness to share even when you don't entirely know what it will look like or what will happen tomorrow. Um, it just it shows how strong our community is and how lucky your students are. So thank you so much for your participation. Um, Jeff is going to close us out and we thank you so much. Thank you Trillium and thank you again to all of our panelists. And I hope you've seen some of the comments coming through in the, in the chat. I think this has been a very um, important and powerful session. And I particularly appreciate the emphasis that all of you are placing on student well-being and um, and the value that we all place on the community that we are part of within our individual schools and that we collectively within the New England Association of Schools and Colleges are a part of community. We talk about learning communities being a school. I think we're realizing that really that word community probably needs to come first before the learning can happen. So remember to continue this conversation on Twitter using the hashtag NEASC forum and know that this will be this recording will be on our uh, website as are our other uh, webinars, including ones where we've covered some of the questions that came up today. One about uh, 
sports um, and recess um, and many other topics um, in our archives. And in two weeks, we will be conducting our next webinar uh, with a similar panel. We hope they are as um, articulate as you all have been. They will be secondary or high school uh, teachers who will be starting out their school year and we'll hear from them. So for our panelists and my co-host Trillium and everyone at NEASC, I'm Jeff Bradley from the uh, Commission on International Education saying thank you and be safe. <laughs>